In this podcast, we're going to be talking about one of the most debated topics in contemporary Greek history, that of the Greek Civil War. We're going to go beyond the Greek Civil War and talk about the post-war period and the turbulence of a dictatorship from 1967 to 74 and the reestablishment of democratic rule that has lasted until today. In our previous podcast, I talked to you about the various wars that Greece was involved in, from the Balkan Wars, World War I, and the outbreak of World War II. Here, going back, we see the dictator, John Methaxas, on the eve of the Italian ultimatum to Greece, when he issued the famous no, that he would not cede Greek territory to the Italian forces, and that Greece would fight the Italians. Benito Mussolini had underestimated Methaxas and the revitalized and reorganized Greek military. For soon, the Greek forces, instead of being swallowed up by the Italians, had pushed them out of the Greek lands and halfway up into Albania. Here you could see the invasion portion. Yet Methaxas, ironically, for as much as he tried to avoid war and to stay neutral, and for as much as he wanted to be popular and was not, during the years preceding the war, preceding World War II, at the time of the war against Italy, Greece got into war. In addition, it was the first time that John Metaxas was a popular leader. He was not able to live very long to enjoy his popularity, for at the end of January 1941, he passed away due to natural causes. King George was faced with a dilemma. Does he go back and select a politician and fall into the trap of the politics and the hatreds of the national schism, or go beyond and find someone else. This he did by selection of Alexander Gorizis, K-O-R-Y-Z-I-S, who became the interim prime minister. He was a banker and not involved in any particular uh, political party. So for Gorizis, he was dealing with a situation of an active conflict in trying to prevent German involvement. This he was not able to do. With Operation Marita, that began in the spring of 1941. Pretty soon, by the 18th of April 1941, the Nazi troops were on the outskirts of Athens. Gorizis was unable to deal with this destruction of his homeland and shot himself instead of giving up the country to the Nazi forces. The Nazi forces enter Athens on April 23rd, 1941. By that time, Another prime minister, Tsouderos, T-S-O-U-D-E-O-R-O-S, is selected by King George, and they go down to the island of Crete, and from there to Cairo, Egypt. So the Greek government in exile is going to spend most of its time in Egypt together with the British forces. So here we have another image of the Nazi tanks going through the capital. Greece has a very interesting history during World War II, as as it is the only country to be occupied by three different Axis powers. Here you can see in the slide uh, in front of you the three different powers and what they controlled. The Italians held the most geographical expanse of land, yet this was not the most militarily or strategically important areas. Those were held by Germany. So the red portions that you see, Macedonia, the border of Turkey, some of the Aegean islands, parts of Athens, Piraeus, and parts of Crete were held by the Nazi forces. Most of the countryside, as you see in blue, were held by the Italians. The the green portion that you see was held by Bulgaria. This was exactly the same territory that Bulgaria had controlled after the Balkan Wars. In this region that they sought to take over, and bring in to the Bulgarian state, they engage in massive ethnic cleansing in the area. It is a very destructive period for the Greek people. What do we know about the the occupation of Greece? That each region, each type of occupier had a different type of strategy. For the Italians, for the most part, it was kind of a live and let live, both for the Greek people and the Jewish citizens who lived there. In contrast, the Germans were absolutely ruthless. And there are cases where you can have one town, and I want to bring your attention to this island, Evia, right here. In the capital of Evia, this island is Kalkis. On the flip side is a small little town called Kimi, K-I-M-I. 
And there are individuals there who give a primary source testimony as to what happens during the switch between Italian occupation and German occupation. The Italians came in, occupied it, took many of the resources, but basically allowed the people to live. Once the Italians withdrew from Greece, and this occurred in the summer of 1943, when Benito Mussolini was ousted from power, Badoglio, Marshal Badoglio, comes in and takes over, and Italy switches side to the Allies. This made all of the Blue Territory come under the supervision and control of the Nazi forces. Once this happened, what happened to the people in the small town of Kimi? Immediately, the men were rounded up, taken up to the top on the hill at church, and shot dead. Requisition of all food happened. Absolute terrorism. An inability to negotiate with the occupier occurred. For Greece, like other Eastern European countries, their type of occupation was extraordinarily brutal and repressive. The Germans did not pay any attention to the racial lineage of the Greeks. They considered they followed along Falmarai's perception that the contemporary Greeks had no blood linking them to their ancient forefathers and could be treated as second-class citizens. Thus, in the Nazi racial hierarchy, the Greeks were at the bottom and were dispensable. Greece, the land, was useful to the Nazis. The people who walked on that land were replaceable. Whether they starved or not did not matter to the Germans. This did cause conflict with the Germans and the Italians during the first couple of years of the occupation, but it shed light on how occupation was done by the Nazis. The treatment of the people, and this is where you have a critical difference between Eastern Europe and Western Europe, those who were racially acceptable, by and large, could barely scrape by in existence. Those in the East were not afforded that luxury. Starved to death, brutally repressed, and basically worked to death. This was the experience of the Greeks during the Nazi occupation. So the Nazis come in in April 1941. By the beginning of June 1941, all of Crete was taken. That very winter, the Germans, by requisitioning almost wholesale everything that the Greeks produced, resulted in a widespread famine in the country. So in the winter of 1941 to 1942, there's a huge famine that occurs in Greece. This is especially felt in the large cities as these urban individuals who did not have any farms or access to growth or production of food felt it the most. Pretty soon people were starving and that winter, which was especially cold, led to disease. Over 250,000 people will die directly due to starvation. Individuals began looking through the garbage cans eating scraps of food on the bottom. Occupation of soldiers used to eat some olives and throw them on the ground to watch kids come and scramble and suck the pits as entertainment. There are more harrowing stories that I really want to get into at this point, but let me get to some of the statistics. What we know, and Violeta Hionidu, H-I-N, uh, H-I-O-N-I-D-O-U wrote a very captivating book about the famine in Greece. And she talks about the biological ramifications for the first member of a nuclear family to pass away due to starvation is the husband. The second individual to die of famine would be the child and the last one to die would be the wife. So you see a meteoric rise in death due to starvation in the country. Children are starving. And pretty soon, photographs were being compiled and sent to the United States and other countries, documenting what the Germans were doing. This caused an outcry by members of Greek diaspora communities throughout Britain and especially the United States. Every day, people died on the streets. People lying down next to a window would keel over, never to get up again. People would come and take off their clothes, take whatever was there, and pretty soon naked bodies were lying the streets. Death wagons came every single day to cart off these individuals who had no money for food, their families had no money for food, and therefore had no money for any proper Orthodox burial. This broke families, broke villages, 
and really broke the bonds between all of the Greeks, whether in the urban areas and the rural areas, and even caused hatred between those who lived in the urban areas with those who lived in the rural areas. These absolutely appalling and terrifying images came to the United States, and pretty soon a war relief organization was established in the United States. This had actually had been organized just following the Italian invasion, but with these photographs, all of a sudden Greeks were galvanized and brought together to help treat the famine that was occurring. As you can see here, the images again echo the, the link between the Greeks and the ancient Greeks, the Greeks and democracy to appeal to the American public. The president of 20th Century Fox, Spiros Kouras, was personally touched by this story. He could not stand to see these Greek children and the Greek individuals being starved on this basis and proved to be a pivotal individual to help donate funds, use famous celebrities to the cause, and to promote the Greek War Relief Association overall. Basil Vlavianos was the editor of a Greek-American newspaper called the National Herald. The Tsakopoulos collection holds Basil Vlavianos' entire archive. There is a treasure trove of information for the Greek War Relief Association and other aspects of this very difficult period in modern Greek history. Yet what was the main goal of the Greek War Relief Organization? Not just to organize food and money and relief goods to come to Greece, but to basically persuade President Roosevelt to pressure um, Winston Churchill to lift up a blockade that the British had imposed on the entire European continent. To Winston Churchill, absolutely no food, no goods, no medicine, nothing would be allowed to come into the European continent. Those territories held by the, the Nazis because they feared that any foods, any medicines that would come into the continent would go directly to the Nazi people and not the starving Greeks or other people who were being mistreated and starved. So for Churchill, he has gone on record as saying, food and freedom come together. Yet even members within Churchill's own cabinet were upset over this type of policy and said that people in Greece were blaming the British people. Even the Nazis were blaming the British individuals for the blockade and for food not being able to come in. Roosevelt was especially critical in trying to persuade, humiliate, and pressure Churchill to reconsider his decision on the blockade. The Greek War Relief Organization is what brought this to light. Their efforts were pivotal in getting Roosevelt to put pressure on Churchill. Here is um, Peter Budouris. He was the director of the GWRA in the Western States. Here are some of the appeals, the call for help. And you can find this in the Vlavianos archives in our special collections. Fundraisers, and believe it or not, the first um, performance by Frank Sinatra was actually done for the Greek War Relief Association over in New York City. Local American efforts, Greek American efforts, that is, across the country, even in Sacramento itself. King George had come to appeal to the U.S. Congress, and here he is with uh, Franklin Roosevelt. He'll be speaking to Congress regarding the situation. Pretty soon, they were able to coordinate, and the British relented and allowed Turkey, of all countries, to provide the initial uh, ships of grain to come in to help the Greek people. This first ship, Gurtulus, and you have the translation there, is liberation. They brought food and hope for the Greek people as they bring it in, and it was guaranteed to be given to the Greek people. Only six shipments of Turkish grain were able to come to Greece. After that, the bad harvest of the year and in internal political pressure on the Turkish government led them to kind of stop this kind of donation and trade to Greece. Pretty soon, another plan was put into motion that was orchestrated by the GWRA. Canadian grain would be sent to Greece on Swedish ships. The Swedish ships would be perceived as neutral and therefore non-belligerents, and the Nazis agreed, and so did the British. So relief came for the starving Greeks, and you see some food lines here. And children finally beginning to eat, clothing and shoes. By the mid-1940s, this is one of the iconic images 
for the Marshall Plan and American funds coming into the European continent and also to Greece. For it was Marshall funding in Greece that allowed children like this little girl for the first time to ever wear shoes. She is looking down at her feet, not because her shoes are so pretty, but because she never knew what shoes were. There are many people who never knew what it was like to wear a shoe. During the war, and I have here the Liberation Parade, let me go back and talk to you about the occupation. So I mentioned how it is ruthless. The Nazis burned down entire villages wholesale, shooting people arbitrarily, terrifying the Greek people so that they didn't know what would happen. The starvation that occurred also psychologically traumatized the Greeks as well. So in response to this, Greece, like many other European, Eastern European countries, Eastern I'm emphasizing, immediately organized resistance groups. The first resistance group that was going to be organized was that of EAMELAS, the National Liberation Front, AM, and the Greek People's Liberation Army, ELAS. They were the first ones and were organized in 1941. It was populist, it had members of various political parties, and included the Communist Party. The Communist Party had a pivotal role in this resistance movement as they had been banned by Metaxas and understood how to organize underground movements. They knew how to communicate with each other, so they already had the techniques and the experience of organizing illegal movements, so they, were, they played a critical role in Eamelas. Pretty soon, though, a secondary resistance movement is also organized. This is EDES. E K K A. Eves Eka. Eves stands for National Republican Greek League. Eka stands for National and Social Liberation Movement. There's a big difference between EAM, ELAS, and the new Eves Eka, and that is Eves Eka was staunchly royalist, anti communist, and very limited in its political spectrum. They would not allow, allow any communists to be members of it and didn't promote a very pan-political type of organization. So let me get to a couple other factors regarding these two groups. So to talk about EAM Elas, the first one, the one that had six political parties that helped organize it. Pretty soon, the communist membership of EAM Elas began to dominate the organization. Yet they never used overt communist propaganda to recruit people. Rather, they used very popular terms. Food, shelter, hatred of the Germans, resistance to the occupation, and linking Eam and Lasse's cause to that of 1821 and the liberation, the friendly society, it's a nationalist liberation campaign against the Ottoman Turks. So they're linking their 1941 campaign against the German and showing links to 1821s against the Ottoman Turks. Both they wanted to show as liberation for the Greek people as a very patriotic campaign. So this was initially the approach that was used. Yet slowly from 1941 all the way to 1943, the communist domination also began to use some communist rhetoric in the propaganda leaflets. Most of the Greek citizens who never voted for political principle, but rather uh, personalities, missed this communist rhetoric. They didn't quite understand the subtleties of what was being written in these pamphlets. They said, Greeks rise up against your oppressors. Greeks rise up against the foreign... Um, occupiers. So for them, they saw it in nationalist and patriotic terms. They didn't understand that the leadership, the communist leadership in Eamelas was laying the intellectual groundwork for them to move leftward politically. <clears throat> in contrast, <clears throat> in this Eka, which was staunchly royalist, by 1943, had seen what Eamelas was doing and understood the communist propaganda that was being passed through all the membership. They had hated communism, 
and were staunchly royalist. Even members who were Republican, who were Republicans, meaning wanted a Greek Republic, a very conservative group, but did not want a king, had to acquiesce to accepting a king. So they were very much on the far right. Like I said earlier, they didn't accept members of all the political parties. They only wanted conservative membership. So they hated communism, and the British gave a lot of funds. And initially, the British actually gave funds to both organizations, both resistance groups. But by 1943, the communist rhetoric in Ea Melas's propaganda prompted the British to cut off any sort of funding. By 1943, they did not want to see an, um, an identical carbon copy situation occur in Greece as had occurred in Yugoslavia. Tito had monopolized the resistance there, and he controlled political power, and that's exactly what occurred after liberation in Yugoslavia. So for the British, who saw the communist rhetoric in Greece, they were not going to support it, and this is why they gave all of their funding to Eveseca. Now, that might not seem so problematic, and for the Greeks, that was in and of itself not a big issue. What tainted Eveseca? was that by 1943-44, it was fairly clear that the Nazis were on the losing side of the war. Those who were part of the occupationist government in Greece, so the administration that was governing Greece, Greeks who were part of the you know, occupying administration from 1941 until liberation in October 1944, were seen as traitors selling out to the occupiers. These individuals in 1943 understood their situation, and it was a bleak one. So many of these individuals tried to save their lives by joining a resistance movement. Eamelas would not accept them, but Aves Eka would. So for them, even if they were Nazi sympathizers, even if they were outright collaborators, they were accepted by Aves Eka. So in taking a look at these two resistance organizations, many of the Greek people got caught in kind of a moral limbo and confusion as they might be supporting the liberation of Greece, being absolute Greek patriots, yet getting caught up in a political conflict between the two resistance movements that are going to have significant effects on themselves and how people are labeled. So you can be someone who's a very moderate, politically aligned individual, but if that person joins the Amelas, by 1944, that person was going to be pegged as a communist, and that person's identity card in the post-war world is going to be marked, will be marked as a communist. So initially, from 1941 up until 1943, Eamelas and Edeseca are going to try to kind of work together. They're going to jointly organize a campaign to blow up a critical bridge that links central Greece to southern Greece, Gorgopotamos Bridge. And um, I'm not going to even try to spell that correctly, uh, Gorgopotamos Bridge. And please look this up in the clog book. And, but by 1943, the fact that the British had cut off money had led to a situation where these two groups became very antagonistic. The Germans are going to be exploiting this exact situation. And by 1944, they were already strategizing their exit from Greece. So what do they do? They exacerbate these tensions between the two resistance groups to their advantage. By encouraging conflict between the two groups, they would be too busy fighting against each other and not so much the Germans. They are able to escape relatively unscathed. But what ends up happening is you, the Germans and the British are laying the groundwork for an outright conflict at the end of the war. Here we see a liberation parade in October 1944. This should have been one of the most joyous uh, periods in all of you know Greek contemporary time. However, at the end of the liberation, all the conflicts that occurred between Amelas and Adeseca, and at one point the vi they became they started fighting each other so much that Amelas nearly wiped out Adeseca, and Adeseca was so it was so upset and wanted to get back at Amelas that following the liberation of Greece, 
the post-war leaders, these immediate post-war leaders, decided to put um, in, implement a policy that would be incredibly destructive to EAMELAS. They told them that upon liberation, all of the members of EAMELAS were to put down their guns. Not such a bad policy. However, they did not require Eves Eka to put down their guns. All of a sudden, members of Ayamelas, who had been so prominent and so critical in achieving the gains and getting rid of the Germans, now found themselves in a position where they would be giving up guns that would be used against them by a Eka. This prompted them to organize a protest. And here we have members of Ayamelas. And for all of those of you who might be interested in doing women or any sort of gender studies, if you take a look, these women are getting absolute equal rights. So it's a whole different perspective. So some of the confluence, uh, uh, communist type of ideology is seeping into AMLA. So we see a lot of these women not just being in peripheral areas for the conflict, either offering, making food or being serving as nurses. These women picked up machine guns and they fought just like men. Here are Eves Eka and Napoleon Zervas. Napoleon, you could spell Zervas, Z-E-R-V-A-S, was the leader of Eves Eka, very staunch pro-British individual. So you could see them over here. So on December 3rd, 1944, Eamelas decides to protest this new law that they had to completely disarm themselves. All of a sudden, though, the British were stationed in the capital fired shots against many of the protesters. It turned out to be all-out war. And in the capital of Greece, right after liberation, we have a small civil war. This was limited to Athens itself, but proved to be a decisive turn in the events that were to follow leading to outright civil war. The members of Eamelas were being shot at, persecuted, killed. And here people are leaving the actual um, Parliament Square after that. And you see some of the British forces with their, with their guns right there. So after this violence that was kind of set up and exploited by the British soldiers. So you have British soldiers fighting against uh, Greeks in Athens itself, and nobody's stopping this. All of a sudden, a new law is issued. Eamelas must disband. They must dissolve themselves. They can no longer exist. Many of the individuals saw the writing on the wall, and many individuals also had read in the newspaper about the percentages agreement signed by Churchill and Stalin, ironically, not quite signed, but checked off, on a cocktail napkin. Many of you go to Google and take a look at that percentages agreement. That little cocktail napkin still exists today. You can see an image of it. What is in this percentages agreement? Stalin agrees that 90% of British influence could be exerted in Greece, that the Soviet Union would only have a 10% amount of influence over the political fate, the political destiny of Greece. These two leaders horse traded the fate, the destiny, and the lives of the people in Eastern Europe, from Poland to Greece. So for many individuals who understood what was done in the percentages agreement, they knew that the British were here to stay. So they went back to mind their own business. Yet there is a group, a hardcore group of Eamelas that refused to give up. And they reorganized themselves and renamed themselves as the Democratic Army. So the um, agreement to force Eamelas to dissolve and establish a post-war government occurred in the suburb of Athens Varkiza, V-A-R-K-I-Z-A, in February of 1945. The Communist Party is also outlawed. A government was formed and the king was voted to come back to Greece. The Democratic Army was also being organized. And here you've got from 1945 to 1949, the outright Greek Civil War. So what happens in this period? You have an established government and you have an, a group, the Democratic Army, who is resisting and wants to overthrow this government. The Democratic Army, led by, controlled by the Communist uh, Party. So uh, the Democratic Army makes no bones about it that they're outright communists. They, they don't cover it at all. 
yet they're not getting the direct support by Joseph Stalin of the Soviet Union. They're not getting any tanks, they're not getting any troops, they're getting nothing. So who are they going to appeal to? Their next door neighbor, Joseph Tito. And Tito, what does he do? He will give troops, he will give money, he will also give military equipment. What was in it for Tito, though? For Tito, he asked of the Democratic Army that in the event of their success in overthrowing the sitting Greek government, that Macedonia, the part that is in Greece, that includes Salonika, would eventually be given to Yugoslavia to be part of a Balkan communist federation that Tito was organizing. So this portion of Greece, this northern portion of Greece, the Yugoslavs saw as a southern Macedonia to be reunited to the northern part of Macedonia across the border, which would be the sixth component, the sixth member of the communist federation, this communist bloc that Tito was, in, was developing. So the Democratic Army had made a deal with Tito regarding the Greek Civil War. And in this period, 1945 to 46, they had reorganized themselves. 46 to 47, they had secured all the support from Tito. And from 1947 to 1949, they were fighting against the Greek government. Most of the fighting actually occurred from the center of Greece and northwards, especially in the mountainous area. Here you could see some of the Democratic Army bases that were across the Greek border. So the purple is actually uh, Greece. This is Yugoslavia. And there were members also in Bulgaria. So there were a lot of supporters across the, the border of Greece, both of which were solidly communist and even in Albania absolutely communist. And here we have an image of Democratic Army fighters. So as they are trying to fight, in 1947, what also occurs? Great Britain, which had been one of the three great powers helping guide Greece, getting involved in Greek affairs, was facing um, decolonization in the British Empire. They could no longer afford to be a protecting power to Greece. They were facing their own political difficulties. They had to reconstruct their own countries and had no extra money to be given to Greece in any way, shape, or form. So what happens? They, Churchill begins to send communication to the new president in Greece. FDR had passed away due to brain hemorrhage and Harry S. Truman becomes president of the United States. Churchill begins communicating that the communists are going to be taking over Greece and that unless the United States steps in, that Greece will fall to the communists and all of a sudden then Turkey is going to fall and a domino effect will occur going all the way into Asia. This domino theory of communist takeover in the globe was persuasive enough for, uh, for Truman to do a couple of things. First off, goes to Congress in March of 1947 and requests $400 million, 300 of which is going to go directly to Greece, 100 million is going to go to Turkey. In addition, the United States fundamentally changes its foreign policy from being neutral and isolationist to that of activism. And with this decisive change comes the Truman Doctrine. Most of you have probably heard of this doctrine. So the Truman Doctrine and it was created due to the Greek Civil War. So to a large extent, Greece was one of the first battles in the Cold War period. This is another interesting topic that people can go and look at. So the United States is now taking over, sending in $300 million, sending in advisors, sending in all sorts of equipment, troops, people, you name it. At the same time, the Democratic Army is only getting funding and support from Yugoslavia. So pretty soon, they're being encircled, and their chances for success are limited. In a kind of Hail Mary in 1949, the Greek Communist Party plays Russian roulette. 
Joseph Stalin had already kicked out Yugoslavia from the common form, the, con, uh, the Communist Information Bureau. And that was forcing all other communist countries to abide by this decision. Well, the Greek communists were going against Stalin's will by engaging with Tito. So the leader of the Greek Communist Party decides to denounce Tito and appeal to Stalin for Soviet help, thinking that the Soviet Union might send troops, might send tanks, might send whatever to assist them in their campaign. Unfortunately, this Hail Mary did not turn out the way the Democratic Army expected. Stalin sent nothing. Stalin had maintained true to his word regarding the percentages agreement. The most that Stalin was willing to do is to help the Greek communists in the United Nations should this conflict go there to this newly created institution. What was bad for the Democratic Army was that Tito, upon hearing that he was denounced, immediately closed the borders in July 1949. By September, the Greek military, together with U.S. support, had defeated the Democratic Army and September 1949 marks the end of the Greek Civil War. Many Greek individuals, many children of the Democratic Army went across the border and were raised or lived in the Eastern Bloc. This is a very kind of hotly debated topic occurring right now in Greek historiography. For the rest of the Greek people, they had to deal with reconstruction of their devastated homeland. For as much of the devastation that the Germans exacted, Bulgarians had exacted, and to a limited extent the Italians had exacted, it pales in comparison to the death and destruction that occurred in the Greek Civil War. Greece is now going to have to not only reconstruct their towns, their buildings, their villages, but the hatreds of the Greek Civil War.